was Friday Night Lights, Clarksville, Ohio, last quarter. The home team pretty much had the game locked up. Their star player, Michael Ferns is his name, six foot three, 235 pounds. He's got the ball. He's running down the left sideline, 52 yards, about to go into the end zone, and he steps out at the one yard line. The ref, who was downfield, thought it was a touchdown, so he called it. And Ferns steps in and argues with the ref and says, I did not score, I stepped out. So they reverse the call, they line up on the one yard line, and a bench warmer comes out a young man named Logan Thompson, and he gets the ball, and he scores the touchdown, and he did it for his dad, who had died from a stroke that week. Michael Fern stepped out so that Logan Thompson could step in and score, and then those two guys, they embraced in the end zone. And when you see that picture, there's something inside of you that says, wouldn't the world be a lot better there's a lot more people forfeiting their touchdowns so that someone else could win. And there's something just beautiful and right about that. There's a desire in us to see more of that kind of selflessness. And yet at the same time, I don't know about you, but with me, like if you and I are gonna play a game together, like Monopoly, I'm gonna try to kill you, you know? <laughs> I'm very competitive. Like, if I have 14 touchdowns, I really want a 15th touchdown. <laughs> and yet this young man's willing to forfeit that. And that battle goes on inside of all of us. And today we're going to look at the fourth quarter in Jesus' life. We've been on this journey from Genesis all the way up to this moment where Jesus has a few minutes left on the clock, actually. We're at the point in the story where the author of the story has entered the story in flesh and blood and he's shown us what it looks like to be a human being fully alive. He's shown us what it means to know that God is with us. And now he's down to the last few moments. He's going to sacrifice his life. And in this last evening, he, he's with his 12 disciples in the upper room and guess what the disciples are arguing about? Who's the greatest? They literally, they all think they're Ali. You know, it's like a foot like a butterfly, sting like a bee. We're the greatest. They're all arguing about who's got the greatest stats, who's the top of the heap. Can you imagine how exasperating to Jesus this moment was? By the way, it's not the first time they've argued about who's the greatest. At this point, we have three other conversations where they're arguing about who's the greatest. Can you imagine how exasperating that would be? Because Jesus has told them, over and over again, Mark 10, 45, look at what it says. For even the Son of Man did not come to be what? Served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And it is an understatement to say the disciples did not get it. They didn't get it. Jesus modeled it for three years right in front of them. He taught them over and over and over again. In fact, it's interesting. The word leader only shows up in the New Testament six times, but the word servant shows up more than 200 times. Jesus is trying to make a point that they have missed. So he's going to show them one more time. Right before his death, he shows them one more time, and he's going to do it through two symbols. One is a symbol that involves a basin and a towel, and the other symbol involves a meal. And here's the big idea for today. Write this down. To understand the rationale for the author's death, we need to understand the reason for the basin, the towel, and the five cups. And these two symbols, these two metaphors that Jesus gives us, we are still unfolding them. We are still exploring them 2,000 years later. And they involve a basin and a towel, and they involve five cups. And it says this in John 13, verse 4. Let's read it out loud together. It says this, Jesus got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Jesus walks over. He picks up a basin and a towel. And can you imagine? That's quite probable the argument about who is greatest suddenly went silent. 
And the reason for the basin and the towel is this. You can write it down. Jesus is saying, I have come to be your servant. That's what he was saying. I mean, imagine they started to notice out of the corner of their eyes that Jesus was taking this towel and wrapping it around his waist, and they are probably curious, what's he, what's he going to do? And then he picks up this basin, and they know exactly what he's going to do. Now, remember the scenario. It's first century Palestine. There aren't any paved roads. They're all dirt roads. There's no sanitation system. So the road is the place where you dump trash. There would literally be human excrement and, and animal defecation in the streets. And you're walking these dusty, dirty streets all day long. And they're about to sit at this table and have a meal. And it was a low reclining table, which means your feet are going to be all up in someone else's face. And after a day on those dirty roads, you had some stinky dogs. And it was a Passover meal. It was a moment of holy worship. Those feet needed to be washed. But in the ancient world, the washing of feet was perhaps the most menial task. In fact, if you look at ancient literature prior to this passage, there are no accounts of anyone of a higher status washing the feet of someone of a lower status. In fact, even in the Jewish culture, let's say you were a Jewish person and you were an indentured servant or a slave, you weren't required to wash feet. That's how menial it was. We won't even make our indentured servants do this. And Jesus picks up the basin and the towel. And remember who this is. Jesus is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He is God in the flesh. He is the one who created everything and sustains it with his very being. God almighty, God immortal. He picks up the basin and the towel. And he walks over to Peter. And he literally bows down before him. And Peter is shocked, just like you are. This isn't a setup. He didn't know this was coming. <laughs> it's kind of a little awkward. That it is, he said. <laughs> and in fact, Peter was offended. Jesus went to grab his feet, and Peter pulled his feet away. He said, no, no, you are not going to wash my feet. You're not going to do it. And Jesus said, well, if you don't let me wash your feet, then you'll have no part of me. In other words, if you don't let me serve you, then you can't have what I want to give you. If I have a present to give you and you cross your arms and say, I'm not going to take it, then guess what? You don't get it. And Jesus is saying, you need to let me serve you. And then Peter, being exuberant, was like, well, then wash me head to foot. In other words, let's do a sponge bath, you know. <laughs> and Jesus said, no, if I wash your feet, it's enough. Wow, he's got him double laced. <laughs> Man, your mom would be so proud, bro. <laughs> Had that really great knot. Let's see what these dogs look like. <laughs> Pedicure, nice. Let's put that one down. Now, you got to realize what's going through their heads. You know, they believe Jesus is the Messiah, and even after three years, of showing them something totally other than what they expected, they still didn't get it. I mean, they were expecting the Messiah to come and be a military ruler, a general on a war horse with a sword, and Roman blood would spill in the streets. And when the Messiah comes, the only weapon he has is a towel and a basin. They expected a Messiah to come and force people to bow before him. But get this, this Messiah is actually bowing before us. That's crazy. And Jesus was saying to Peter, you need to let me wash your feet. And Peter felt unworthy, and so do we. And see, there's some part of your soul right now where you feel 
shame and unworthiness. Maybe for you, it's something that happened to you when you were a child, something someone did to you, and even right now, you just feel this shame, like you're dirty, and you don't want anyone to see it or know it. Or maybe for you, it's something to do with a mistake that you've made that wounded those that you love the most, and you did the thing that you thought you would never do, and you feel so much shame. Or maybe there's a habit, and you're enslaved to it, and you thought you were strong enough, but you know you're not strong enough. And it, it owns you, and you feel the shame. You don't want anyone to know about it. I want to ask you, where is the area where you feel the most shame, where you want to hide your weakness? That's the very area where you need to let Jesus hold you and touch you. And when you do, you feel unworthy. And that's why we need the meal and not just the feet washing. There you go, brother. <laughs> Your socks. Remember to double lace them. <laughs> and after he washed their feet, he invited them to a table. It was the Passover. A meal with a long and storied history. And what Jesus wanted them to receive that night through the foot washing, through this meal, was his unconditional love and the amazing grace of God. And what Jesus is showing us through the foot washing, you can write this down, it's this. Service is not an activity but an identity. Service isn't about an outward performance, but an inner posture. It says this in Philippians chapter 2. It says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Paul says he's in very nature God, and then he's also in very nature a servant. In other words, when we get a peek, when we pull back the veil, and we get to see the nature of ultimate reality, who is God? Paul says God is a servant. And Jesus showed us what that looks like over and over and over again. You know, it's possible to serve and not actually have the posture of service. Any parents in the room where it's like, all right, the kids have to take out the garbage and all the way down to the curb, it's like, <laughs> right? I mean, I'm serving, but I'm not a servant, right? Clean your room, you know? And there, see, there's no freedom in that. We're still trying to earn. We're still, try, we're still trying to take the place of a higher status. But Jesus showed us the freedom of a worldview that is one of a servant. There is a generosity, a freedom, an expansiveness that comes when we realize our king is a servant king. And that means I can be a servant of the king in whatever I'm doing, because it's an inner posture. And everything in our world tends to celebrate that which is seen, that which is elevated, even in this room, it'd be easy to come here this morning and from a, just kind of a standard worldly perspective, it's like, well, obviously what Rob is doing to serve is the most important thing because it's got the cameras and the spotlights and the, you know, so that's the really important thing. But what Jesus is showing us here is it's the menial thing, the unnoticed thing, the quiet thing that truly reveals that worldview of a servant. You know, right now there's somebody in a room back there that no one sees, and they're, they're changing a dirty diaper. And that is precious to God, believe it or not, the stinky poo-poo. <laughs> because that baby matters to God, and those parents matter to God, and someone's quietly in an unnoticed way doing that job. There are thousands of people in this congregation 
just doing things quietly behind the scenes. You know, Friday night, there's a team that gathers and they fill up backpacks with food for kids, at-risk kids. They're in the neighborhood there of Avenue of Life because those kids would be hungry if they don't have a backpack full of food to go home over the weekend. That's precious to God. That's real freedom. So I want to ask you two questions. Will you let Jesus serve you in the area where you feel most vulnerable and most unworthy? And will you go and serve? Serve in quiet and unnoticed ways. Because you know what happens when you go and do that? When you begin to bow down before someone else and wash their feet? You know who you meet down there? You meet Jesus. You'll meet God. Will you let Jesus serve you? And after the foot washing, they came to this table. And it, it's, it was time to take a meal. It's actually a meal that we're going to take today, this Passover meal. And uh, I've invited Dan Chavron, our executive pastor, to come and help me with this next section. Dan and Leslie, with their boys, and Anna, they've had this tradition as a family for years of actually... <laughs> Uh, celebrating Passover as a family, which might seem quite odd, um, but when you understand the background, the context for this meal that we call communion is Passover, it makes actually a lot of sense because it's only if we understand Passover and the way Jesus actually uh, embraced that meal and then also changed that meal that we really understand what communion is and how it is that Jesus has served us through this meal. So Dan, help us, uh, tell us a little bit about the communion uh, history that goes back to Passover and what was Passover yeah, about? It's, it's beautiful. It's really beautiful. So we have the ultimate servant, Jesus, and he's just washed his, his friend's feet. And then he leads them in an ancient service. The Passover was a meal, but it really was a service. The Passover is called a Seder. Seder actually means order. So there's an order of service, and it, it, was, it had been done for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, and it symbolized something very important to the Hebrews. The story comes alive, and so does, so does our, 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 our uh, communion comes alive when we understand some of that history. So Jesus is leading the Passover meal, and that Passover meal, first and foremost, is a meal of remembering. Hmm. It's a meal of remembrance. Well, what are they remembering? What are they remembering? They're remembering something that God had done for them in the history of the Hebrews. They were remembering how God had promised to free them from the Egyptians, and then he freed them. So through the meal, they're remembering. And Jesus is leading, and he, he's sharing. Remember, God's people were slaves. Remember, God promised to set you free. Remember, God sent plagues to your oppressor to break his will so that you could escape this slavery. Remember, God instructed you to, to sacrifice a lamb. Remember, God told you to put the blood of the lamb sacrifice over your, your doorposts. Remember, the angel of death passed over your door. Mm -hmm. You were passed over, and that's what... Passover is mean, means it's protection. It's a passing over of judgment. So for hundreds of years, the Hebrews, and even to this day, remember God's slavery, or the slavery they were under and God's restoration, his rescue of them. And in that meal, they would, they, the, the meal was interesting in that it had different elements in the meal that are very powerful symbols, mm. and they would literally take them in. They would eat the story, mm. experience it, they had things like uh, bitter herbs. Bitter herbs, they would taste bitterness of, of slavery, that captivity, oppression, injustice, tasting. They would literally taste it. Ugh, ugh, terrible. The, they would dip into salt water, very salty water, and they would taste what it would be like to have tears mm. pouring down your cheeks because you are, you, you're, you're being abused and used. The sadness of that, they would experience it. They would, they would have lamb, which symbolized that sacrifice. Mm -hmm. 
and they had unleavened bread, un unrisen bread. It had, it, it, it was, it, they were instructed by God to do, use flat bread because you're not going to have time. You're going to have to escape. Be ready at any time. He was preparing the Israelites to be able to go. And, that, and to this day, matzah, they, they, they have flat bread. That's why it's flat. Because God had instructed them, make the bread this way, that way you can go and take your food with you. Hmm. It's amazing. And there were also four cups. So it's a very symbolic meal. It's an order. It's a worship service. And the cups were very meaningful. And, and they, they represented four promises that were in Exodus 6. They were promises of God to redeem his people. So you imagine Jesus is presiding over this meal, hmm. and they're remembering as Jews what God had done for them. So that brings us to the first cup. Jesus had said to his disciples, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover meal with you before I suffer. And he would have taken that first cup as was a part of the Passover tradition and lifted that up. And this cup actually was taken before they even began the meal. And he would have quoted this promise from Exodus chapter 6, where God said to his people, I will bring you out from under the burdens. And here Jesus is infusing it with new meaning. As surely as Israel was burdened under the yoke of slavery by Pharaoh in Egypt, what Jesus is saying to his disciples and to us, we all have been burdened by a yoke of slavery to our own brokenness, to our own selfishness, to a world where uh, we are constantly facing the consequences of the brokenness and selfishness of other people. We all know what it's like to taste those bitter herbs mm. and, and the tears that have fallen down our face because of what someone has done to us or what right. we have done to someone else that we deeply regret. And it's a burden. It can be suffocating. And mm. Jesus is saying, I can lift that burden. When he lift that cup and quoted that promise, he was saying, I can lift that burden. In fact, Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And then Jesus drank from that cup, and he would have passed it to the disciples, and they all would have drank from the cup of sanctification. The second cup is called the cup of deliverance. The cup of deliverance means I'm going to deliver you from something. I'm going to rescue you. It's a promise. So Jesus lifted the second cup. This would have come before the, the meal, before the first course of the meal, and it would have come from Exodus 6.6. 6. I will free you. I will free you from being slaves to them. Hmm. So this cup is a reminder that God's love, his power, is a freeing power. It isn't one of oppression. It's yes, the opposite. It yes. It's the opposite. In God, we find, we find freedom. And Jesus would have lifted this cup, and they would have all known, that's the rescue cup. That's the rescue cup. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. Now, the third cup is, is a very interesting cup. The third cup is the cup of redemption. What does redemption mean? When you redeem a coupon, you trade it in. Is that right? Redemption is an exchange. It's a payment. When you redeem, you exchange something. And Jesus lifts this cup, and which is a promise out of Exodus 6.6. 6, and it says something interesting. It's, it's a promise to redeem. And, and God's promise in Exodus 6.6 6 says, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. Mm -hmm. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. And in that, Jesus was saying, I love you this much. I love you this much. It's extraordinary. And he said this in Luke 22:20. 20. In the same way after supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, mm. which is poured out for you. Mm. Maybe the most profound thing ever said, this is the new covenant mm. in my blood. Jesus took the Passover from a history lesson 
to fulfillment of all of God's promises. All of prophecy, it went from looking back to looking to right now. Mm. Within 24 hours, Jesus would go to his death on a cross to pay for our sins, to redeem us. And that's what that cup meant. The very Hebrew word is for, for, for Passover is, is protection. And, God, and Jesus was about to do that. So he was going to redeem us by giving his life for us. And the fourth cup, this is the cup of protection. It's based on God's promise in Exodus. I will take you to be my people and I will be your God. I will cover you. I will cover you. Jesus said, I wish I could just, like a hen, I could just cover you with my wings. That's the protective love of God's chosen people. So I will take you to be my people and I will be your God. Passover means protection. So this remembers God's promise to protect his people from a coming judgment. Judgment for sin. And free them. Now here's what's amazing. We see by the story that Jesus chose not to take this fourth cup of protection. Because just before that, after the third cup after dinner, he said, I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until this day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. So Jesus foregoes the cup of protection. He will not be passed over. He will not be passed over. He is going to take the punishment. He is going to stand in our place. That's, that's an amazing Savior. That's ultimate love. Greater love has no one than this, that he lays down his life for his friends. And that's what Jesus was doing by foregoing the cup of protection. And the foregoing of the protection cup led to this fifth cup, which was the cup of iniquity or the cup of wrath. You see, these four cups were a part of the origin of Passover, but over the centuries, a fifth cup was added. So by the time of Jesus, there was a symbol, a fifth cup, the cup of wrath which finds its origin actually in Jeremiah 25. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel said to me, take from my hand this cup filled with the wine of my wrath. See, the fifth cup was the cup of iniquity filled with the consequence of sin, which is death, chaos, suffering. That's what filled the cup of wrath. This is a cup that's filled with God's judgment against sin. There's a deep human longing for justice. Hmm. You know, you don't just turn a blind eye to the Holocaust like it never happened. You don't turn a blind eye to 9-11. If a child has been abused by a sexual predator, we don't just turn a blind eye. We want justice. And that's what the cup of wrath is, that there, there has to be justice. And see, when justice is pointed towards someone else, I think it's a great idea, but then when it comes to me, uh, I'd rather not have that. And what's interesting is no one actually drank the cup of wrath. The other four cups were passed and everyone would partake, but the cup of wrath was set aside and it would be poured out. Because who wants to drink the cup of wrath? Nobody. And see, it's the symbol of foreshadowing. And it's this fifth cup the cup of wrath that Jesus is referring to when after the meal, he goes into the garden of Gethsemane and look at his words. He says, Father, if you're willing to take this cup from me, the cup of wrath, yet not my will, but yours be done. And see, it's in the context of Passover that this passage in Luke 22 makes sense. Jesus is saying, I'll drink the cup of wrath. Mm -hmm. Like, I have a cup of wrath that I've been working on for 46 years, and it's got thousands of iniquities in it. And it's led to extraordinary pain in my life and extraordinary pain in the lives of other people. And Jesus is saying, listen, there's a cup that has your name written on it. And in the garden, he's literally going to drink a cup that is filled with the wrath of all of humanity, past, present, and future. 
How sobering is that? There aren't words to describe the profundity of that. And Jesus, the ultimate servant, look at what he says next. He went away a second time and prayed, My Father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. In his infinite love, Jesus was willing not to hand us over. He wasn't going to hand us over to the cup of wrath. He said, I'll drink it. And that's what he was doing the next day. When he hung on the cross, naked, abused, tortured, he was drinking down my cup of wrath and your cup of wrath all the way down. And what do these five cups tell us over and over again? Jesus is saying, I have come to be your savior. And that is my ultimate act of service is to lay down my life because you are worth it. And the thing about letting someone serve you, you feel unworthy. You feel like, no, this is too much. And for some of us, that's the greatest challenge this morning. <laughs> is to actually open up our hearts, our souls, our arms that wide to receive that kind of raging, reckless, unconditional love from God. Tony Campolo, in his book, Letters to a Young Evangelical, he shares this really compelling story. It's one of his first memories, and it actually took place around the communion table. And I want you to listen to his words. He says, the preacher had been talking about grace and forgiveness. And Tony was just seven years old, he said. And he said, I became aware as a young man that there was a lady in the pew in front of me. She was probably in her early 20s. And as the preacher went on and on about grace, she cried and sobbed and she shook her head and she kept muttering underneath her breath, no, no, no. As the preacher talked about forgiveness and grace, she kept muttering, no, no. The communion elements were passed. And as the elements came to her, she let them pass by. She wouldn't take it. And Tony said, I remembered my dad, who was this big Sicilian man. He leaned forward to this young lady, and in broken English, he said to her, take it, girl. This was meant for you. Take it. It was meant for you. And I want to say again this morning, take it. It was meant for you. Beyond worthiness and unworthiness, beyond fidelity and infidelity, there's nothing you can do to make him love you more, so give up on it. And there's nothing you can do to make him love you less. Amen. He came to serve you. And will you let him serve you in that area where you feel most unworthy? And will you receive again today the gift of amazing grace to say that he's already done it? You're forgiven. And I want to invite you, if you would, right now to close your eyes with me. And the amazing thing about the story is that it's still being written and that this story is our story and that right here, right now, the resurrected Savior, he bows to wash your feet. And with the eyes of your heart, I invite you to see that. The one before whom one day every knee will bow. He's willing to bow before you and wash your feet. And that third cup, the redemption cup, he's going to give you that cup today. And the reason he's going to do that is because he drank your wrath cup. So now you can drink in redemption. And you get to have the bread of his body broken for you. The elements will be passed in a few moments. And as they come to you, hear Jesus Christ say to you, this is meant for you. Let's wait silently on the Lord.